thing to say. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, all right, so here's the good news, guys. Only 10 posts are required. So if you've already done 10 posts, and you are happy with the average grade you got, that's it. You just have these two papers left. Um, if you have like 10 posts, but one of the grades was low, you can do another post, get a higher grade, and I will throw out your lowest grade and add that. Uh, the final grade, it's 50% of your final grade. If you hand in fewer than 10, I just add up all the numbers and divide by 10. Technically 10 is required. Um, so I would recommend it because the grade will get lower. So that's where we're at on the post. Here's the research paper, uh, conferences with the, with the Lion students. I'm gonna go over it carefully in another a few days when the AUW students have a have a vacation day. Um, all the work is due by April 29th for the AUW. Uh, the research for AUW is the 23rd. Um, if you don't do a post, just read the assignments, come with some reaction to the material. You don't have to type it into a post, but I do want, you know, the students to contribute because you don't like listening to me talk for an hour and a half. That's just too boring. Um, so Agamemnon we do today and we do next class. Then the AUW students have a day off and the lion will go over the research paper. Then we finish up Agamemnon. Then I, then I have a, a PowerPoint um, not a lot of reading for that day because you're supposed to be working on your research paper. Then I have, um, then we do some Play-Doh and these are not long assignments. The reading from the Phaedrus and the outline, this is about Eros, what happened to Eros in Athens that led to the fall of their democracy. So it's the corruption of Eros. Then we talk about Socrates' way of life. He's just a classic type. And we talk about Euthyphro, the religious leader, because I think a lot of my, a lot of my students at Lyon and AEW are exposed to a lot of religious beliefs, whatever, whatever they happen to think or not, they probably have opinions and they'll probably understand this dialogue. Um, then on the fifth, the AUW students, this is their last day of class. They give a formal presentation about their research paper. Then the, the Lion students have a, another week of class. We'll do the symposium. Then, then the final week, the, the Lion students discuss their papers. So the AUW students don't come to class after the 5th of May. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Then the final papers, they're basically what, what, do you, what did you get out of the class? Like what is your takeaway that you learned the most that you think is the most relevant moving forward? But at least half of the paper needs to discuss something after the Greek gods. So we had Delphi and Olympia, we have tragedy, we have all this stuff, Plato. So, and then conferences are required. Um, AUW, it's due the seventh, Lion, it's due the 14th. Okay, are there any questions about this schedule? I've posted it on the Google Classroom the same day as today. I just posted it, but um, 
So that's, that's that one. Then we'll go to, um, all right, so we have three days for reading the, <coughs> the tragedy and it, it's not a lot of reading. I think it's 15 pages a day or something of just um, theater, which is not very long reading. It's not very difficult reading because I do know that, you know, you have a month left, you have a research paper, but in your final paper, you know, is it's going to make a difference if you actually read this carefully and you come up with some good ideas. That'll make a difference. So, um, so that's how I've structured the situation. Now, what I want to go through first is um, I I think I'll do the tragedy, how tragedy works. So. This is, and, and we've been talking about the arts, right? So when we did the goddesses part, I asked you to bring examples of art uh, created by women, about women, for women, right? And then we talked about the place of the arts in education, educational systems, and we, ha we have talked about tragedy, but let me go over it again, because now we have a tragedy that we're actually applying this stuff to. It was a really important part of creating a society of, of citizens that think critically, right? That live and examine life, that do all the stuff that this class triggers a certain kind of reflective consciousness that I think all of you have gotten into the groove, right? Um, so it wasn't familiar at first because it is not at all. It's kind of a dead uh, academic discipline the, and that part of the mind, that way of thinking was killed off in the enlightenment or they tried to kill it off. But um, anyway, if that's that for the Greeks, that was the most important. And the way to educate it is through the arts, through telling stories. And so if you want to educate people about science, you tell a story about the universe and then people get attached to it. They learn how to live in relation to it. Um, but in Greece and in the city states, people would go to, to tragedies. And so all the people from many different classes came, people from the rural areas came to religious festivals. So it was a big, uh, collective community event. Um, and then in Athens, they even had a contest so that the there was a council and any playwright that wanted to write some tragedies would go before the council. They would pick the top three. Each tragedian got to perform three tragedies and then a satyr play. So that's just like Delphi. You have three really serious plays and then just this huge body sex you know, a bunch of nymphs and a bunch of guys chasing him around and it was crazy. So, um, so I think you'll see when we, when we go through this, that it is trying to trigger, trigger that critical thinking skill. And if any of you, um, I'll stop periodically and I'll just say, did any of you have a reaction to what you read that you wanted to bring up? And then also, if you can think of analogies, right? Or think of your own experiences. Do you know somebody like that? Do you know of somebody who took revenge like that? Do you know of somebody who manipulated somebody else and convinced them to do something really stupid? <laughs> so there's lots of ways that I'll describe what went on that you could, it might trigger some kind of a, identification, like, oh, that's kind of like that. 
So I'll try to do that because because you know each play has its specific strengths and weaknesses and character flaws and situations, but I think you're supposed to think of it in this much broader context where everything is connected to everything. People who take revenge in one context, uh, you know, the question is, did they learn their lesson or did they go and take revenge over here too, you know? So all of this stuff is just kind of the way we make choices in our lives. So, um, all right, at Delphi Olympia, all these, this was just so much a part of the culture. Um, there's a, the point, all the, the people watching it knew that the playwright was trying to educate them. And so they were supposed to like want to learn and take pleasure. Oh my God, I get that, right? Don't do that. And so you walk away having watched all this blood and guts and gore, but thinking, I think I'm, my character has been strengthened because I think if I get into a situation, if I just remember this, I'll be able to not overreact. And so you appreciate that, right? I'm glad I learned that lesson. I'm glad I, you know, this trigger in the back of my mind, you get kind of inoculated. It's like a shot. It's like a vaccine. <laughs> All right. So what's most important is the choices. And so you'll see the characters in Hecuba. They have a lot of really good opinions. They all think virtue is wonderful and they all think being a good ruler is a good thing. But then when they make a choice based on that principle or those beliefs, it's the completely wrong choice. It's the wrong application of the principle or Hecuba knows that revenge is wrong, but she's going to do it anyway. <laughs> so either they just go bad or else they misapply a principle or they're, they're proud and arrogant and blind. And so um, everybody, all these characters, Odysseus, Agamemnon, uh, Polynester, and Hecuba, they all think they're pretty good. And even when Polynester is obviously a bad guy, he goes, yeah, but you guys are worse. Or, but you guys, I mean, it's just, people do that, right? Well, I might be bad, but look at that guy, you know? So it's, it's like life and it really, we're all tempted to do that, but we all should try to be the grown up in the room because it just creates more problems. Um, and I, we sort of know this, I think, in our left brain. But how do you train yourself or other people so that when the emotions hit, you're going to be able to resist? That's the hard part, really. Um, in a critical moment, you don't have time to think the stakes are really high. And so you, you had your character, you have, have to have strength of character, you have to be prepared. Um, the characters are intermediate. They're not particularly good or particularly bad so that people can identify with them. So um, in this, and I think a lot of the tragedies have a character who's super good and a character who's super bad but then it has these people sort of in the middle and, and the one that it's named after, Hecuba, she's the one, the reason the play is named that way, I think, is because she does do a horrible thing, but I think you can identify with her because she, she had 50 kids and 49 of them got killed. <laughs> and so, so when they killed her youngest son, who's the heir to Troy, like that was the last hope for the future of Troy. She just goes bananas. And so I think the play is called that because I think Euripides is saying, we understand Hecuba, but you still shouldn't have done it. Whereas Odysseus is 
a bozo, like he's not going to learn anything. He's unteachable. And Agamemnon is unteachable. Those guys are so full of themselves. <laughs> They're so arrogant. Um, but Hecuba, she knew better. And yet she still chose it. So that's why I think um, she's the tragic character. Um, they're true to type. The characters are related. So in this era, when you had, a, okay, so Agamemnon is, his culture there, the Achaeans who went to Troy, they're a, a federation of city-states. So that's like an aristocracy where you have a few families running the government. And then Hecuba was the queen. So that was a monarchy. Um, and, and so their relationships between each other and then, and then the relationship between the leaders in the city state. And so there's really important dynamics going on there between the leaders and they make bad judgments. Um, so when Agamemnon knew he shouldn't let Hecuba have a private conference with Polynester, she appeals to him. She says, well, you know what it's like um, to be the king, you know, to, and I know what that's like. And can you imagine this friend, you, you give your kid and they kill your kid? Oh, yeah, that would be pretty bad. <laughs> the thing is, Hecuba is the enemy. Like, she's the, the queen of your enemy that you just, you know, decimated in a war. <laughs> but she appeals to the fact that if she is a queen or she wasn't, you know, us top, top of the line folks, you know, we have privilege, you know, that other people don't. So they're really abusing their power and their relationships at that privileged class level. So I'll talk more about that, but just these bonds of affection, um, the people that we need the most, family, friends, are often the ones that hurt us the most because we need them. <laughs> um, so if they make a mistake, it really makes a difference. Um, okay, so the play is trying to teach you about decisions, your choices and the reasons you make those choices. Those are decisions. Human beings just, uh, they don't just act and they don't just respond to what's around them. They have reasons and that's why the human behavior you shouldn't just call it animal behavior, human behavior. That's not right. It's animals, you know, there, some of them are more social, social, and that's fine. It's great. It's just humans make decisions and humans have this imagination and they have these belief systems and they have ideas about principles and ideas about good and evil and all this stuff that animals, you know, they don't debate good and evil. I like animals. They have a lot of them have a lot more uh, emotional, you know, I mean, you, you watch them behave and the moms take care of their babies and wow, that's great. And there's some actually human moms that don't do that. That's horrible. Well, that's true. It's just that you got to deal with human beings in a different way because they're both better and worse than animals because everything they do is linked to some kind of worldview and some kind of reason. So you have to be really, you have to analyze that. And so these, these plays are trying to help you think about how you can do really awful things, but you can convince yourself that they're really good. And so you have to be careful. Um, Let's see, the goal is emotional education. So you identify with these people, you're afraid like, oh my gosh, I could do that. And then you flush that out, you flush out those bad opinions, you flush
flush out that revenge fantasy and you move on into something creative. Um, so the goal is to flush out repressed emotions or overreactions and um, flush out even the desire to do them because then you can focus on something creative. But you know, when people uh, have something terrible happen to them, you can't just tell them, well, suck it up, get over it. That's not, it doesn't work. And therapists will say you'll end up you know, in the therapist's office. Um, but so the tragedies are trying to say, to acknowledge, yes, here's how you feel. Go ahead, feel it. Sit here and feel what heck you just feel and let yourself identify with her. And then look at what she did and all the pain and suffering. So you can process it so it's in your head and decide, okay, I think I can, I can move on, right? It's very different from just pushing it down and repressing it. Just, or you can just say, I will move on. I know eventually I'm gonna be able to move on if I just let myself admit where I'm at. Um, all right, so let's see. Those are all the basic rules. And then uh, we're going to have each of the characters. And then, like, what's the main archetypal issue with this character? But it's also scenes. There are certain scenes and where they're actually de deliberating. They're talking about good and evil. They're talking about justice and injustice. And then there'll be a few more you know, things that happen, events, and then some more characters get into a critical situation. And then you sort of analyze that section. Um, all right, let's see. Um, then I'll do this just for a second. Um, Aristotle's, oh, I didn't want that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Okay, I wanted Aristotle's virtue, so I'll go down here. Um, so we'll keep in mind that um, we're gonna see these characters. So we have, we start out with Polyxena. She is, she is the um, shining light. She, she is the one who really achieves human excellence. And so when you watch her and the way she dies, you go, wow, people are capable of that. And so the playwright is reminding you, people are capable of very, very high levels of excellence. Even when other people really mistreat them, okay? Um, so, because the other characters, Odysseus, Hecuba, Agamemnon, and Polynester, they, by comparison, then you can see how proud, greedy, you know, corrupt, you can see more clearly what they're not. And then you can see their weaknesses better because it's this shining light. She's the light that shines on that and exposes them and how they delude themselves and their opinions are just inadequate. So um, a main scene here is um, the, the, let's see. Temperance isn't, oh, okay. The main issue on temperance is that Paris made these choice, right? Every young person has to choose. What is your ultimate goal? Is it going to be pleasure and wealth? Is it going to be honor and status, popularity? Or is it going to be rule for the sake of the rules, wisdom, justice, um, truth? Um, 
what are you going to choose that is what organ the organizing principle in your life and we talked about this a lot but of course paris chose aphrodite and that's what started the war and eventually troy was completely decimated it was sacked the Achaeans got in there, they raped the women, they killed children, they did oh, they were just barbaric. Um, but anyway, they had the just cause was that Paris stole Menelaus' uh, wife. So it was correct to go over there and insist that you have to uphold international agreements. As I, as I said, right, if Michelle and Barack Obama went to Russia, and Michelle got kidnapped, like, you know, the whole world would would go crazy, you know, I, every country would take sides and, you know, so it, it was a just cause. It's just that if the United States had then gone into Russia and dropped three, 10 nuclear bombs on them, that would have been overkill, right? And so that's what they did. They completely sacked the place, um, but they don't feel too sorry for it. They don't regret it, right? They're both Agamemnon and Odysseus. Just, you know, they know they're right. They won, whatever. Um, so courage, there is uh, Polyxena. Um, so each of these characters, or Polyxena especially, reacts to fear. Um, so big issues here are anger and then revenge. So how do each of these characters deal with anger? What about ambition? What they think they deserve? Um, whether they, how they use their power, right? So Odysseus has power, Agamemnon, Polynester, and Hecuba talks about power. So. Um, do they deserve to have the level of power that they have based on what they do with it and what they think about in terms of legitimate uses of power? Pride. Um, do they think they're honorable people or not? Do they over, you know, are they um, excessively proud, not proud enough? Um, friendships, that's what I'm saying, where Hecuba tried to create this friendship bond with Agamemnon, and that was really inappropriate um, truthfulness. So in the Greek view, the polyxena is the truth. So when it comes to practical affairs, it is the choices you make where you are embodying the truth. There's no truth other than this per this this choice in this situation being concrete, manifested, chosen, it's right there. That is the practical truth. The practical truth is not an opinion. It's an action and a way of life. Then we have the political virtue. So you see the personal characters of these five people and all of those personal characteristics have tremendous implications for the political life. So all of them make decisions that impact the reputation of their city state. And it impacts it for the next 30 years, at least for a generation. So the choices they're making impact their whole city for, uh, for another 30 years. And they do a pretty bad job of it. But Okay, so in this case, they're not legislating for their city state, but they are, they have these universal principles according to which they're acting. And some of the principles are good, but the choices are bad. Um, how to distribute wealth, so, or distribute social goods. So that would be, um, when Agamemnon allowed Hecuba a private meeting with Polynester, he that was a bad judgment. She should not have get, gotten that kind of social status and social uh, privilege. Um, rectifying wrongs, definitely. 
how do you how do you fight back when you've been treated unjustly and they all make terrible judgments about that how to apply the laws they make bad judgments about that um okay so i will now we'll just go to the play i think um let's see see if there's anything else all right so i am actually i'm just going to read it to you um I'm going to read this section to you because for some reason the first page is the same, but then the pages are different. So, and I, I didn't want to give you my version because it's all marked up and I didn't want you to, you know, to think, oh, that's what I have to care about because that's what Dr. Professor Beck cares about, you know. So, Okay, so I will talk for a while, but I will stop. And so I would like each of you to have some reaction, something that's stuck out to you. Um, either it did before you came to class when you're reading it, or something I said, just anything so that you don't have to listen to me talk. Um, all right, so right at the beginning, it's Polydorus. Let's see if this is, maybe this is right. Maybe it's just slightly different. It looks different, but. All right, so this is really important. It starts out with Polydorus. This is her youngest son. When you are a monarch and when you are the queen of a monarchy, your number one task is to give birth to a boy, right? Because that's the heir. And if there isn't a male heir, there's going to be instability. There's going to be a power struggle. So she had 50 kids, but she, she and her husband sent their youngest son to their closest friend in Thebes, Polynestor, with a lot of money so that if they lost the war, there would still be their youngest son and there would be a lot of money. He could go back. They could start rebuilding. All right, that's really smart. Um, but obviously that meant a lot to Hecuba the future of my city-state. So now we know that Troy has been completely sacked. So this is her last hope for her city-state. So then as the play starts and, and he explains that Polly Nestor, who Hecuba trusted with her youngest son, when he found out Troy lost, he killed that little boy to get the money. Now, the playwright is also sending a message because everyone who's read the Iliad or knows the Iliad, which would be everyone watching the play, knows that Achilles refused to fight and then he decided to get back into the fight for all the wrong reasons, which is a whole other story. The first person he killed was Polydorus, which is really horrible. Achilles is horrible. You kill the youngest son of the Trojan. In other words, this isn't just a war for right now. I want to completely wipe you guys out and give you no future. That's horrible. Um, and so the Euripides, is saying, look, I know that you know that the story is Achilles killed Polydorus. This is not history. I'm trying to teach some moral lessons. So I'm just gonna tell that counters another story because they could have sent him over to Thebes, right? 
this it would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So here's an alternative history. Um, all right, and so then he does talk about um, how he got killed. And let's see. So this is where obviously Polly Nestor has chosen money out of uh, Paris's three choices. What happens when a ruler chooses wealth? It ends up destroying him. Um, Troy also was the wealthiest city and Priam thought he could buy off the Achaeans. He brought a whole lot of money to pay them so that they would leave Helen there because he really thought money could buy security and safety and happiness and uh, peace. And he was wrong, you know. Money can't buy everything and they were you know, their, pri their uh, pride was wounded and so no way. Um, anyway, so once again, money doesn't buy you what you wanted. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Then we have Hecuba coming in, and she's in pretty bad shape, right? Um, but, you know, I mean, we can feel for her. Um, and she's she's had these bad dreams and she's kind of worried that Polly Nestor, you know, she says, she prays to the gods, I pray that Polly Doris, my anchor uh, and last of the house, right? He's the last one, but I dreamed something happened to him. And it's, uh, she's, really in a bad place. Um, all right, so then they find out that their, their daughter, so she has Polly, uh, there's so many names, they all start with Polly. So um, Polly Doris, that means a uh, great gift, multiple gift. He's done now, he's dead. Polly Zena is the daughter and Polly Nestor, is the king of, of Thebes, so. All right, so then she finds out that Achilles died, and the reason they're there at Thrace is the winds won't blow. So um, this is another big theme in the anti-war war stories, which is these men get their egos all caught up and I'm gonna kick Trojan butt, you know? I'm gonna go over there and show them who's boss and I'm gonna go over, you know? And yet, if the winds don't blow, <laughs> you're toast. Or if the winds blow too much, which actually happened, a whole lot of soldiers died on the way back because of storms. There was too much wind. So now the wind has died the same thing happened at the beginning and Agamemnon had to kill his oldest daughter in order to get the winds to blow. So now here they are again, the winds aren't blowing. They've stopped at Thebes. Okay, this is important. Polly Nestor is giving them hospitality, okay? This is the whole war thing was about uh, Paris violated hospitality agreements, right? You don't steal the, the king's uh, wife. <laughs> That's one hospitality agreement. There are other hospitality agreements, but that'll do. So now, um, Polly Nestor and Agamemnon have a hospitality agreement. He's given Agamemnon hospitality. So that's sacred, right? You don't violate that. And um, and if they did, Polly Nestor's people could come and just massacre them, right? <laughs> so you just don't do stuff like that. So here we are there. And what, what the news is, okay, is that the reason the winds won't blow is that Achilles is in Hades. 
and he needs to have his virgin. Uh, so again, I think these all of these stories are telling you you should not use women as spoils of war. <laughs> it just creates all of these problems. So um, he, okay, so Odysseus says uh, that he promised the troops that whoever fought the bravest, whoever was the bravest soldier, would get um, the princess, right? So she, again, we, you know, we beat you, so we're going to take the king's daughter and slaughter her, you know, for the, uh, the bravest soldier, who's Achilles. That's so sick, guys. And I think the playwrights knew that's really sick. Um, but that's the story, is that Achilles wants his virgin. And Odysseus says, you know, I have to do this, political necessity. I promised the soldiers that I would do this, and I can't break my promises, because then next time they won't fight. All right, guys, step back. Was that a good when the, when the whole problem with the war is lust, right? Is male lust for a beautiful woman. Would you then, you know, would you then use male lust for a beautiful woman to motivate your own people? <laughs> I mean, the point was, you're a bunch of barbarians. You know, you stole somebody's life. And I mean, it should be, no, no. Our society honors hospitality. We love justice, right? And you don't, all you care about is sex. But then Odysseus tells the troops, if you are brave, I'll give you a lot of hot sex, <laughs> just, right? Does everybody understand that? Like you're really no better than the guy that you're so self-righteous about. Um, all right, and so then what they talk about is that, okay, so the Greeks had the Ecclesia and I was talking about that with Delphi and with um, Lycurgus, the citizens met and the rulers had to be transparent. They told them, you know, we have to make a decision. And they voted um, in Troy. The Trojan people voted the same as Priam. And over on the other side, they, they voted against Agamemnon, but he had the power to make the decision anyway. But in this case, so um, Agamemnon, is sleeping with Hecuba's other daughter, Cassandra. And he speaks in favor of not killing Polyxena. But uh, the troops are suspicious, right? I mean, he has a biased opinion because he's sleeping with her sister. Um, so again, it's a don't do that. In other words, that is a bad decision for a leader to make because you can't trust his judgment. All right, so Agamemnon speaks for Polyxena, but Odysseus comes and what they say is then he used rhetoric. Um, he perfumed his appeal, the air thick with his words, the wily Odysseus spoke, um, all till his audience swooned at his feet. Um, and so the, so the idea is he won because of his ability to manipulate people with his rhetoric. And that's a major theme in this play and in life, incidentally, um, that the, the educated class has this power of rhetoric. They have learned how to speak persuasively. And they can use that for good or evil. 
So Odysseus is abusing his power. Um, so then Odysseus comes to get Polyxena um, and he says the troops, um, okay, so here he comes and he says, well, the troops have voted for this when we already know that, no, you manipulated them. They were sort of going the other way. But Odysseus, oh no, you know, they voted to do this. Uh, Hecuba, I think you know the army's will and verdict, right? I'll state it anyway. The Greeks have voted to offer up your daughter on Achilles' tomb. They've authorized me to be her guard and escort. <laughs> Just, does everybody understand that? Uh, Odysseus, you're the one that manipulated them into voting that way. Don't give me that BS. Um, then he says, Neoptolemus will preside over the rites of sacrifice. So Neoptolemus is a young man, just coming of age. He's the same age as Polyxena, right? They're just stepping out into public life. And Polyxena is going to get killed. And Odysseus, the middle-aged guy, is making the young guy do it. Really? He's making, he's forcing this young man to slaughter <laughs> this woman the same age as him. And, and that's kind of how he's going to get recognized and given status in the society which again is a pretty bad choice, I think. Um, and then he says, don't, now Hecuba, be sensible about this. Just accept your, your lot, right? Your fate. Hard luck is best met with level-headedness -headed, and expediency. Well, it wasn't her fate, right? It was Odysseus' manipulation of the situation. But he just comes and he tells her, oh, you know, it's too bad, Hecuba. Um, then on page seven, they talk about an event from when they were in Troy. And Odysseus was in the apartment of Helen and Hecuba. And, he and they knew it was Odysseus. He was disguised, but they knew. And Helen spotted you. So Hecuba is saying, you remember that when you were there? And Helen knew it was you. And Odysseus says, yes, I thought I was going to get killed. And you remember when you grabbed my knees and begged for your life? And so Odysseus and Hecuba said, I chose to free you. I saved your life. Um, so aren't you shameless now that you come and try to kill my daughter? Like, why didn't you try to convince the troops not to do this? Because your life, you know, I, you would have died if it weren't for me. Um, you yourself just admitted the mercy you got from me. And now you do me such evil in return. Oh God, save us from politicians and demagogues like you. Those are, that's the rhetoric. Who don't care what harm you do as long as the multitude are pleased and the applause is loud. Um, and Odysseus says, well, it's political necessity. I have to do it. I gave him this promise. I can't break my promise. And so, uh, Hecuba gives a really, really good speech on page eight about political uh, leadership. And she says, those with power should use that power carefully. Those who are lucky should not assume the luck will hold. Um, have pity on me, reconvene the army, persuade them it's wrong to kill the woman you spared because you pitied them in Troy. Um, remind your men that Greek laws pertaining to murder protect enslaved and free alike without distinction. So this is breaking Greek law. 
uh, you have the power, the authority, and the eloquence. You can speak well. Um, even if you babble, you have a great reputation. And so, so the idea is that he could have said, you know, we're not going to kill this young woman because our laws don't allow it and it's, it's not necessary, it's not dignified. I mean, we can, we can do better than that. And I think Hecuba gives a good speech. He has a great reputation. We can have mercy on her. The troops would agree with that, that a good ruler has mercy. Um, but he comes back, you know, and he says, no, I promised. And what the troops wouldn't go to war next time if I didn't uh, make these promises. And so he's just assuming that you have to appeal to, to lust, this sort of low life. He's cynical about human beings, like what really motivates them. So instead of being a ruler who exercises mercy, justice, tempered with mercy, he just says, nah, it's all about lust. Um, our cities would fail if noble and devoted soldiers earn no greater returns than do lesser men, right? So the greater returns you get to have this virgin. If we go to war again, would we have the troops ready to deploy? You know, if the men would say, why bother? I don't get to have sex. I don't get to have hot sex. You know, why should I uh, risk my life? Um, and then, so I'm gonna just do this page and then I'm gonna stop and give you all a chance. But this section from page eight, to 10 or so, um, oh, eight actually. So eight and nine is this confrontation between Hecuba and Odysseus. Page 10 starts with Polyxena, which is really, uh, she's really a very, she's the light, <laughs> she's the, the standard against which we should compare ourselves. Um, but the, the punchline on this one is where he, Odysseus says, this is so disgusting, um, you foreigners, you Trojans, um, you feel free to violate hospitality agreements, right? You don't keep your friends friends and you don't respect the dead, right? So you don't, I'm respecting the dead and we keep our hospitality agreements. You're just a bunch of barbarians. Uh, that's why the Greeks stay on top and you get the barbarous fate you deserve. Like you deserve to be trashed. You deserve to have your daughter killed because you broke hospitality and you don't respect the dead. And um, the thing that's very ironic about this, and there's so many plays like this, any kind of self-righteousness like that, I'm better than you, any kind of moral superiority complex in just two scenes, right? Two more scenes ahead, Agamemnon violates hospitality agreements. Right, he does the very thing Odysseus says, we're better than you because we don't do that. And then he goes and does it. <laughs> so I, so the point is, you know, critical thinking. Like, don't think you're better than somebody else. You have to learn empathy. I could do these brutal things. It's, it, you know, we're all human. We all have the same range. Don't think it couldn't happen to you or you couldn't do something really barbaric. Don't be self-righteous and don't go blaming the other guy. Don't cast your shadow onto somebody else. So let me just stop and um, 
ask students to just see if you had some reactions of your own. Um, I'm talking way too much. Um, anyway, Espina, did you have a reaction to what you read? There she is. Rupia, did you? Okay. Did you have a reaction, Rupia? Okay, Claire, did you have something? Um, mine was simple. It was just kind of in the beginning. Um, when it talked about the overwhelming, just people getting so overwhelmed. Um, that their reactions are so great. I think that this is just humanity in general, just being a human. But as you said, training yourself and all of these characters represented just maybe an extreme case of overreacting or not having a trained sense of character. But that's what stuck out most to me, I guess, because it's so easily applied to our lives. It's, it's a big factor, but that's what jumped out at me. Okay, so... So you understand that thinking that you aren't capable of that, right? I'm not a barbarian, you know, is not the way to go. It's just realizing that I probably could do that if I were in that bad a situation. Or I would certainly have fantasies about it, right? And I just need to learn, you know, how to keep life in perspective. So Good. I'm glad I just, even though it seems extreme, um, just understanding we have common sense. Um, uh, Elizabeth, did you have something? Are you there? Yes, sorry. Um, we kind of talked about this, I think, in uh, legacy of Greek Civ. Right. And um, shoot, I totally forgot what I was going to say. Um, I'm looking at my notes, actually. Right. So actually, the thing is, we did this in a certain class that say uh, that Elizabeth was in. But you know, second time around, see if you can come up with more stuff, or see if after reading the material earlier in this class, it just uh, strikes you differently. Just stuff like that. That's what I'm looking for. Um, so in the in the post or not the post, I yeah, yeah, the post for the day, you mentioned how we should try to tie in Aristotle's virtues. And the one thing that I noticed is that a lot of these characters act like they they try to make it seem like they have virtues, but in reality they don't. Good. So that's that's kind of like the main thing that I noticed. Um, I guess Hecuba tries the most to have these virtues because she's trying to like save that little ounce of dignity that she has left as a queen or a monarch and it just doesn't really work because she gives in to her, to her anger. Yeah. It was because she thought she was more dignified that she stooped lower. I think that that's probably what it is. She thought that even if she stooped lower that her high status would help save her, but it didn't really. Or that having somebody mistreat her was somehow more wicked than having somebody mistreat, you know, one of her handmaids, right? That's a super, any sort of superiority complex is really to, leads to even more brutality than the average person. The average person probably wouldn't be arrogant enough to mistreat people as much as a person with privilege. Does that make sense to other people? Too? Um, so that if you have a reputation, if you have status, if somehow people think you're special, you really need to not be deluded by that because then when you run into obstacles, you might do things that are 
more cruel than an average person would do. Uh, I hope that makes sense to people because it justifies the cruelty, right? Because this is particularly egregious because of me. <laughs> okay, so Sam, are you there? She actually is in the bathroom right now. Oh, okay. Uh, Margia, did you have a reaction? Okay, I have, I do have some papers from the students last year, AUW, and I'll post them also. Um, May, did you have something? Uh, uh, yes, Professor. Actually, um, at the beginning of the class, when you talk about the tragedy and more specifically about revenge and uh, moral education, I kind of thought of um, the story of myself like about four years ago when I was in like was a high school senior. Like actually, I at that time I like some of my relatives like they hated me and they kind of spread some of the rumor about me kind of like I offended like people and I offended like relatives I I talk about um some people like behind their back kind of like that but I was not really aware of that until like kind of like one month after that and my mother told me and some of people like like told it to me because the rumor was kind of like widespread and I was very angry, but like, and at that time I was even uh, thinking of the revenge. Like I, I didn't know what I would do, but I feel like, I feel that they really like did a lot of bad things to me. Like, and they, they even didn't respect my family. Um, but then uh, when I went to a UW and I received like the education here, I gradually, I gradually feel that if I just like trapped myself in the, negative part like of being revenge and something I will also end up like living an, a miserable life like just thinking of revenge and how to treat other people the way they treat me um, but instead here like thanks to a wide like variety of causes um, for example like the ethical reasoning cause I can like learn like, how people think in some way and how like they like why they act in a certain way kind of like that and I can understand like why like some people did some bad thing to me even when I didn't really like accept that but at least I could understand like how people's mind like work and kind of like that and also um, I think that instead of focusing on uh, taking revenge or like trying to deal some of the personal issues I can improve the situation by like bringing education to my country to help the next generation at least like the next generation can grow up like treating people in a different way than the way i i was treated before by older people so um and also i feel that when people acted in a like a bad way and like treated me in a in a like bad manner it's also because they they were not like educated on that and they also have a ma many like stereotypes and like they all came together and like kind of influencing how people like acted kind of like that so I feel that like I, I just feel like deeply related when you told um that detail and that's like I want to that's what I want to share okay good so I think it's interesting that an ethical reasoning the whole point is just to think about how they're thinking. Whereas in tragedy, it's sort of you feel how they're feeling and then you flush it out, right? Yes, yes, yes exactly. Yeah, so that that is what liberal education is about, is that sometimes you just use your left brain to think your way through stuff. And sometimes you need to educate your heart and all these you know, people that came before you are trying to pass on a legacy, right? They're trying to pass on some wisdom so that you don't make mistakes, right? Or you don't make as many, don't make the, it's just, yeah. So that's good, May, and it's good that, yeah, it all connects to your desire to improve the educational systems in your country. So that's just a, a positive way, like you can, 
take something negative and make it into something really positive. Um, and so many people's sense of calling uh, originated in some unmet need or some wound and they found a creative way, right? They found a way to be creative and to let all that go because they weren't frustrated anymore. Um, they could just do something creative, make do something so that other people are less likely to suffer. So that's just, that's the point of it all. So very good. Uh, Poppy, did you have something? Uh, Mr. Not yet. Okay. Uh, Untari, did you have something? Yeah, okay, good. I mean, I don't know if, Untari, if you do think Odysseus is a good guy, but I mean, I think the playwright wants to say he thinks he's doing what's best, but he's blind, right? He can't see past himself. Um, let's see. And then afterwards, that's what, that's what we'll get at next time when we talk about Polyxena, he's saying, well, I promised the truth. You know, Hecuba says, well, you could have mercy. And because you have such a good reputation, the people will respect you. They won't think you're, you're weak and they won't think you broke a promise. And he says, oh no, you know, I have to, I've got to give, I got to have this reward of hot sex in order to motivate the truth. And then after she dies, the troops really do start doubting what they just did. And so Hecuba was right <laughs> and Odysseus was wrong. Um, so anyway, I can't quite tell from your post what you were saying, but it is, uh, I just think when you, if you just go through over those a uh, few pages. It's really good at developing critical thinking skills, right? Examining yourself and looking at how he thinks he's doing what's right. And you go, oh my goodness, do I get like that? Or everybody I know, right? All sorts of people make mistakes in judgment, uh, but they, they think they're right. Um, uh, let's see. Al? I also like Elizabeth read it with the lens of look, trying to pick out uh, virtues and vices. And I see a failing of sociability in Odysseus because he's kind of putting it off like, well, she needs to die. It's, 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 it's bad, but we need the wind to come back and, and my men need to get home so they can have their women. So he thinks he's putting up with a small injustice for the greater good when he, um, when in reality, he actually orchestrated the whole scenario. I know. Isn't that awful? <laughs> yeah. And Hecuba tells them that too. You're not, you know, so it's the idea of political necessity. So no matter how powerful you are, there's things you can't do. But this was not a case of that. Um, all right. So Louis, did you have something? Um, yeah, like um, after the reading, I think personally, I think that tragedies is the perfect thing to see how different humans are because we can see like how different people react in different difficult situations. 
and the reaction even intend to connect with the past experience of each individual, I think. And uh, Hekuba, I think she has a personality which we can learn from. Like she accept the failure as a inevitable part of life. I think the human we intended to avoid the failure, the failure part or the dark side of ourselves. But um, I think that um, failure and the dark side is the thing that uh, help we re aware what we are and what we can do to improve ourselves to have a better life. Yeah, what I get. This is what I get. Okay. Um, you could also think about Hecuba when she's debating with Odysseus. She's act. You can tell she's like Athena, right? She understands ruling. Um, and then her relation to her children, it's Demeter, right? So you can look at all the different which which trigger, right? Which goddesses are sort of possessing her at a certain time or moment, actually. Uh, Jana Tool, have you got something? Okay. Uh, Newsra? Okay, Madeline? Okay. Oh, she's having connection issues too. Okay. Uh, Nahida? Okay. Bondona? No, ma'am, I would like to pass because I don't have like charges on my phone. I'm like, You don't have anything to say? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, Rossi? Hi, Professor. Um, I just want to share that when someone is intent be the law by power or fame, and we shouldn't take revenge on something that we're facing because although we try to live in this like kind of perfect world where we want to learn from our mistakes but it's really important to take I feel like to take a step back and don't trap ourselves and trying to take revenge because that is just only going to harm us and if we try, if we open our mind and try to understand what someone is living through, then we will be able to understand why they did what they did and why um, they are acting a certain way towards us. And that kind of alleviate our anger and take away that like feeling of wanting a revenge from us so that we can live in peace by ourselves without trying to harm someone. Okay, good. Um, where was I? Okay. Oh, okay. So that's, that's ter That's fine, Ruthia, no problem. <laughs> uh, Fahima, did you have something? All right. Okay, so I have 20 more minutes. So I think what I'll do, I'll start to go a bit faster. <laughs> um, so there is that scene, page nine there, where Hecuba and Odysseus have these arguments. And I would say Hecuba has, has the better argument, but she loses. And so it's basically Mike makes right, you know, and he didn't, but he didn't say, you lost the war, so uh, you're screwed. He said, oh no, you're a bunch of barbarians. You broke hospitality. This is your fate, you know? You're just getting what you deserve. And I have nothing to do with this, is, you know? Oh gosh, he is so full of himself. But anyway, so 
Um, okay, then she does feel sorry for herself, right? Hecuba has a lot of um, self pity, but Polyzena, here's Polyzena is so amazing. Starts on top of 10. Um, so she says, um, I'll follow you to Achilles' tomb, both because I have to, but also I want to. I didn't want to die, right? Um, but why should I live? And so this, when she talks about this, it really is important for people to think about how when you're young, uh, you envision your life and it doesn't work out sometimes, right? And so you become bitter or mad or you want to fight back. Well, then you think of Polyzena, my gosh, she was the, the daughter of the king. So she says, I had every reason to think that I'd grow up and I'd marry somebody and um, I'd have a great life. And here I am, right? I'm a slave. Um, so I'd rather die than actually get hooked to some, some guy that I have to work for and sleep with. And um, I'd rather die than suffer the shame of wearing slavery's yoke. So, you know, that's reasonable. Um, she does have a sense of her dignity. Um, and the chorus, says the signs of good breeding are all, always impressive, but nobility is even more when it's deserved. So uh, one of the themes in this, in this play is how much of what they are is because of their status that they were born into, how much of it is the way they were raised by their parents, their conditioning, and how much is personal choice, right? And so if you think about it, right, Cassandra, Polyzena, Paris, who started the whole thing, Hector, uh, Hecuba has children that go from the very best to the very worst. Paris is the playboy, right? that started the war and kept it going and had no regrets. He was just awful. So, um, so Polyzena was born with privilege, but didn't, um, you know, she's not full of herself. And Paris was born with privilege and thought it was okay to steal somebody's wife and have hot sex and let the rest of the city fight the, the war over it. So I think what it's getting at is that there's no particular position in society that's going to make you morally better or worse. And if you think because your status, you were born with it, and you think that makes you morally better, it actually makes you worse. It's a corrupting influence. But you don't have to choose that. And, and you can have the same parents, right? But you can turn out bad or good. And so I think what they're getting at is, choice, right? Just like at Delphi, this is the riddle of life. You have to solve it. You have to deal with situations. You become who you are and your moral character is determined by your choices and your reasons for those choices. So Polyzena makes good choices. She makes the right choice for the right reason in the right way. So she doesn't have a lot of options, but her only option at a certain point is simply her attitude, right? So she decides that she's going to go and she would rather die in, as, a, as a slave rather than go and be somebody else's slave the rest of her life. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, and then Hecuba again begs, grabs Odysseus' knee, um, wants to go with her, and you know, 
gets pretty emotional about it. So um, Polly Dina, you know, she feels sorry for her mother. She says, oh, mom, I'm so sorry. This is really hurting your feelings. <laughs> and she's just really, you know, the opposite of selfish. Um, mother, listen to me. Don't try to fight those who, uh, who have you in their power. Don't risk losing your dignity, right? So Polyzina has to lecture her mother about her dignity. Um, that's all right. And that happens, right? Because sometimes parents, uh, children really make better choices and become a moral example for their parents. Um, Partly that happens because Hecuba has suffered so much, right? So when you're younger, you have a little more stamina. <laughs> but if you keep, keep running into terrible situations, it can really undermine your character strength after a while. Um, OK, so I, I think I better summarize what, what I anticipate, what else is going to happen. Um, so I want you to look at this. There's two slaves that come in at various times. And I want you to, I'm going to ask this. Um, what's your reaction to each of those slaves that come in? There's one from each side, right? And um, what does that tell you? What is the playwright telling you about slaves? Um, is the playwright saying that people in that position are morally degenerate? Or is it just, it's just an economic situation? What does it tell you about the, their morality, their moral character? Um, so there's the two slaves, then there's the middle class people, the women that are waiting on um, Hecky. Right, she has a number of women coming with her to take care of her. Um, what is there? The thing about it is, it's because of Hecuba and Priam allowing uh, Paris to bring Helen in. That's why the city there was a war, and so those women have a legitimate claim to be angry at Hecuba, right? But they're they're not, and um, but Hecuba has no respect for them. I mean, she just expects to have these people waiting hand and foot on her, even though like it's her fault that they're 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 slaves. Their husbands were massacred. They have nothing. She just treats them like her tools. Um, so she really has corruption because of her privilege. Um, Odysseus is the same, right? He manipulates the soldiers. He uses his rhetoric to get them to vote the way he wants them. And then he goes, you know, I'm just doing what I promised and I'm just, you know, doing what they voted for. So he's also very cynical in his way of using power. Um, but what does this tell you about when the audiences watch the tragedy happen, right? The playwright is trying to get you not to think in terms of class, right? Think of people in terms of their humanity. Think the slaves have more empathy than Hecuba or Agamemnon. They're, they have way they have moral character. Even though they don't have intellectual, they aren't as smart. They certainly aren't as educated. They aren't as privileged. But they do have their humanity, right? And the women, they have their humanity. You should identify with them. Um, and when privileged people don't, when they don't um, have empathy, they really misuse their power. Um, so then I did want I did want to read you a couple things about 
when you go, you can, next time, I guess I'll give you options for what you'd like to say, but you can go back over Aristotle's virtues and vices, and you can come up with something. But I did want to quote longer sections about um, pride, because um, it's such a case of um, okay, of uh, abuses of pride. So a proud person is somebody who thinks himself worthy of great things. Um, and if a person is great, they're worthy of it, but they usually don't make a big deal out of it, right? But um, the vanity, he who thinks himself worthy of great things, but is unworthy of them is vain, right? Um, that's Odysseus, Agamemnon, and um, Hecuba. Um, Hecuba, okay, let's see. What I'm looking for is, is what he says that, uh, oh yeah, okay. People who inherit status and privilege without excellence, they just got it as a virtue of their birthright. Those who without excellence have social goods like money, privilege, power, are neither justified in making great claims nor entitled to the name of proud. For these things imply excellence. Instead, disdainful and insolent are those who have such goods. They become disdainful and insolent. For without excellence, it's not easy to bear gracefully the goods of fortune and being unable to bear them and thinking themselves superior to others, they despise others and do what they please. They imitate the proud man without being like him. And this they do whenever they can. So they don't act excellently, but they do despise others. And so that's, that's what Odysseus and Hecuba and Agamemnon are like, right? They didn't earn this stuff because of their excellence. And, but they do have this power to exercise all this power over the people. And so they just become disdainful and insolent. Um, so so um, I didn't have you reading Aristotle's virtues, but he just has really extensive descriptions and they fit the characters so well it's just very amazing um well maybe i'll read a little bit more about anger because i did give you this paper that you could read yourself um the one on anger a good temper is the mean in respect to anger he gets angry at the right things with the right people for the right way. Professor, your voice is not clear. My voice is not clear? No. Okay, so is that true for everyone? It's like noise at the back of voice. I feel like there's like a background noise. Hmm. For, okay. Okay, am I, does this help? Or is it the same? Okay, so I just have four minutes left. So if you can understand me, I'll say there, you can look at those sections, you can look at the way the class, you know, the themes of don't think, you know, don't get your identity caught up in what position you have in society. 
what matters is your character. You are a result of your choices, not something, you know, that was given to you. Um, um, oh, yeah. The other thing, Neoptolemus, you contrast Neoptolemus behavior from Polyxena's behavior, she instantly, when she tells the troops, just let go, I will, I'll just go willingly. I'm going to die with dignity. So she, and she says, I'm going to die as a free person. So that's freedom. Um, and then, so she, as soon as they let her go, she instantly gets on her knees and rips her dress open and says, you know, if you want to get my neck, or if you want to get your hair. Um, and Neoptolemus hesitates, right? Because he's being asked to do this horrible thing. So there's this huge contrast. And so that that exposes the ruling, the, the city of Odysseus is completely corrupt. It's, it's turned justice and injustice upside down. And the troops understand that afterward. They say, wow, she was so noble. We have to cover up her body. And they have second thoughts because they have been taught that, you know, the Trojans are barbarians. And they're not. They're like human beings. They're just as capable of good and evil as you are. Um, Hecuba talks about, you know, vanity, money doesn't buy anything. Why do we care about money? Well, that's true. <laughs> um, when people do fight for fame and money, there's a price to pay. Um, your children can get hurt. Your family can get all divided. Um, it is, we need to the, the tragedies are trying to get people not to um, resent their social position. As long as people in the positions rule for the sake of the rulers, there isn't, you don't have so much animosity between people. But when they abuse their power, all hell breaks loose, right? Um, all right, so there's just lots of things. And um, I'll, I can talk about more of them next time. But I also, I'll start out just asking you, was there one of the sections that you really liked you wanted to bring up? And we will read through page um, 25. Beginning of 25, the chorus has a big spiel. So just read through page 24. If I don't know if you have the same page numbers I do, but um, there's a big section where the chorus starts in um, you, my hometown, Ilium. Uh, they're talking about being homesick. So just read up to that, come with some idea, and I'll let you go. Again, you don't have to post unless you want to, um, unless You'd rather have this one count than, than one you, you know, from six weeks ago. So, okay. Take care. Bye, bye, Professor. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Goodbye. Bye-bye.